Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eric Delansky. I am the past president of NACRA and a current associate editor of the Case Research Journal. And I'm going to be moderating the discussion today with our guest, Karen Boroff. I'd like to introduce Karen now. Uh, she is a professor of management and HR and negotiations, which you would have guessed um, also from having read the case that we're talking about today, the incident at uh, Kabul. Um, she is at Seton Hall University, where she was also Dean of the Business School for, uh, for some years, as well as um, Provost and Executive Vice President. She is also currently an Associate Editor at the Case Research Journal, um, and she won the Tate Award, the Curtis Tate Award, um, in 2016, uh, for the 2016 year for her case, uh, the incident at Kabul. So welcome, Karen. You do. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, we're, as we were discussing before the, the talk today, she's also a bit of an amateur paleontologist, having just discovered a fossil uh, under her home. Um, <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about that another time. So I'd just like to begin, Karen, by asking you uh, sort of the background of how you came about writing this case. And, and one of the reasons why I think that, that our audience should be interested in this and why I'm interested in this is it's a different context than we usually see in business cases. And so how you came about uh, writing this, this military focused case. Sure, I have the, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for those kind words and thank you for everybody who's on, uh, on the, in the Zoom call. I do wanna recognize my colleague, Matt Pratt, who was instrumental in, in writing the case, but I also wanna give a call out to all those who serve as reviewers because obviously any submission that any of us submits goes nowhere without the thought and the care that the reviewers give to make the product that much better. And as outsiders looking into the world of academe, one thing that I am, they are continually impressed, upon, or impressed with is the peer review and the collegiality that we give to one another to advance knowledge. So I did want to spend 30 seconds just saluting those who have contributed to the process because the case before you would not have happened but for the multiple reviews and insights that we have received on this as true for all our cases. So uh, this case came about when I had the good fortune of being on sabbatical uh, from my teaching position, I was uh, working uh, at, as a visiting scholar, uh, visiting professor at West Point. And during that period of time, the, they wanted to make a, a textbook for their junior level students. Um, they're called COWS. That's the military term for the juniors. It's an awful term, but that's what it is. So, <laughs> When, so they were preparing this book and it's a, it's a leadership course, a really a grand organizational behavior course and they wanted a reader that would encompass the cadets development at that level. So 1400 cadets go through this course and they were looking for a chapter on conflict management. Matt Pratt, my co-author well, and I were tasked to develop the chapter and so we, as we began to think aloud, uh, developing the theory, developing the materials for the chapter, he shared with me an incident that he had. So it was somewhat fortuitous as sometimes case writing is, where there was a need for a scholarly chapter in a book. Uh, there was a discussion about how to begin the chapter, how to write it, what, what to put in. And so Matt shared with me his video incident that he had. And so we went from there. So it was a nice marriage of, um, of a case, but also it got us steeped into the literature or the theory of conflict, which helped us be a little more studious about the relevant literature that was going to be undergirding the case. The other thing that uh, was important as we talked about writing the case is, uh, is a fundamental thought about people who serve as police, firefighters, military, power, military. You train and train and train and you hope that you don't have to use 
your what you've trained for. So you hope there's not a conflict. You hope there's not a fire where people lose their lives. You hope there's not a protest where there's a police disruption. You hope there's not a war. And in that hope comes the concern that we had about developing something especially focused on how to prevent the conflict from happening in the beginning. So the antecedents of conflict were nested in that overall philosophy of how can you train, 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 but hope by God you never have to deploy what you're training for because other people have protected or preserved an environment where the conflict never had to come for it. In the workplace, it's not as at times as urgent, but certainly as people who lead organizations, regardless of what those are, we always want to figure out a way if we can prevent the conflict from the beginning. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting to me that you mentioned this started off as a case for a textbook because textbook cases tend to be a little bit different than what we publish in case research journal, a little bit more descriptive, a little less focused on the decision. So what did you have to do or how much work was it to take this book that you, this, this case you had written intending for the, intended for the textbook and turn it into a CRJ case? Sure, sure. So um, we wanted to, first of all, we had to, as a normal textbook, had to platform the theory of conflict. So we had to, so that was easy enough to, to do but how to engage the, at that time, the cadets or the students into taking the theory and applying it, the case was going to be the way that was going to be platformed. The, the case, the textbook publisher, as it turns out, is, is Rowan Technologies. They only do electronic books. Uh, so if you Google Rowan Technologies, you would find that a person by the name of Vinnie Viola uh, financed uh, this division of his. Vinny um, himself was a West Point grad years ago. He was a short, on the short list for Secretary of the Army. Uh, anyway, he was interested in book publishing, but electronic books. So we thought that the case would be a nice element in the electronic book with clickables that could happen back and forth. As the, as the students would look at phase one of a conflict and then they'd hear the snippet of the case. So it marched along pretty nicely as it turns out uh, as we were preparing the case and then writing the, the chapter materials. Great. Um, now, this was in a special issue for shorter cases, which uh, we may have members of our audience today who have submitted to our, our current special issue on shorter cases. Um, was it always intended to be short and quick? Did you have to edit it down for the special issue? Uh, was there stuff that you think could have made it richer uh, had you put it in, or or do you think it was more effective as a short case? Uh, it wasn't initially designed as a short case. Um, it was more toward how should I, slicing out the elements that would capture the student's attention. And if we, we all bemoan the attention span that students have um, up at the academies, it's no different. And so the long read wasn't going to happen. Uh, so it was, it was considered to be as compact as it could be, although we hadn't initially designed it as a, a short case. Okay. Um, now, I wanna ask you some questions about the military context and also working with, the mil with, with military personnel on the case. So first of all, the case is somewhat disguised um, in terms of names and, and that sort of stuff. Can you talk through for our audience the disguise process, the decisions you had to make this is a question that comes up a lot with CRJ authors in terms of being able to disguise um, the case. Sure. Uh, I, I don't wanna speak for the army and nor do I have the right to do that. However, in terms of protocols and permissions, whatever we do in our own institutions, I'd say multiply it by 20. And that's the kind of cautiousness that you might have. Uh, 
so there's that cautiousness. Then there is the organizational structure where a major reports to a colonel. The colonel is a faculty member, but it's also there's a chain of command that as a faculty member who reports to a department chair, I, I don't feel that same kind of pressure. I don't know how, to, how else to explain it, but there's an overlay. And if I can just take a small little item to share to impress upon the folks about the chain of command. If a student at West Point does not turn in an assignment, not only do they get a bad grade, but they can be charged with insubordination for failing to comply with an order. So it permeates everything that is done there. And there are times when a student would rather turn in a poorly prepared assignment and get a bad grade to not cross hairs with the chain of command and subordination uh, issue. So we were, as we went through it, there were concerns about whether Matt in doing what he eventually did in the case was defying an order. And would that have exposed him to uh, insubordination or other infractions? So we had, we had multiple discussions with his colonel. Then there were behind the scenes with their attorneys. Um, and um, there was graciousness regarding that with the CRJ. But in the end, uh, I have to say that the department chair was interested in the furtherance of knowledge. The textbook publisher was also interested in that, and that went out. So. Okay. Um, and now, so this is not a business situation. So when you were writing the instructor's manual for this case, how much did you feel you needed to turn this into something that would be more usable in a business classroom? And how comfortable with you were you with this, with keeping this as a military focused case that could be used at West Point or other military, or as you said, police, firefighting uh, institutions? Okay, so the big word that we hear all the time is interdisciplinary. You know, we hear it a lot. Well, if we're going to really live that, we have to do interdisciplinary things. Uh, and an awful lot of what we do in publishing cases in the case research journal are quite elastic for other organizations, nonprofit, public service, state, municipal government. Uh, there's, you know, leadership goes across all organizations, conflict goes across all organizations. And if we wanted to widen our students' aperture on the elasticity of concept, we felt pretty solid about saying, well, this is one way to do this, apart from the increasing number of veterans that are in the class to have some material that was pertinent to them. But it was really to begin to drive home that let's do something interdisciplinary. I have to tell you, though, it was a big learning curve for me because I didn't know an awful lot of this. I knew the concepts, but I didn't know vehicles, full kit. I didn't know all this uniform code of military justice stuff. Um, and even talking with math, the acronyms would come out and I felt like at some point, you know, a dummy, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you take it back a minute? Um, but it was enjoyable. And as a matter of fact, as we were working in what's called the bullpen on the case, other rotating faculty members who are military officers also came out to talk and hear and learn and watch the case development process. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, I have to say, uh, not in my wheelhouse in terms of the case material, but the concepts are, and I'm sure many of the listeners here have concepts that are likewise are elastic across organizations that uh, might be fruitful. 
Okay. Um, and I mean, I think it goes to generalizability as well. This situation, because it has to do with conflict, is generalizable to the workplace, even though, as you said, uh, maybe not at su uh, such a heightened level. Yeah. Um, so in that instance, I mean, the CRJ has gotten submissions from uh, medical context cases and other cases, other other um, types of organizations, as you mentioned. Do you think there's a point at which it's just not usable enough in a in a business classroom, or do you think the wider the better? I think it's going to depend on what course you're looking for. Certainly. If you're in an executive MBA program or an executive master's program where the employee, the, the student has eight or nine years of work experience, they have a broad, you know, a broad range of ideas that might work. Something if you can tolerate more out of context, there's just more there there. I hate to say it so simply, but they have experiences and can translate. And certainly, if any of those students are in consulting companies, uh, giving them some exposure to other organizations is only going to advance their own acumen for servicing those, those people that they wish to their clients. So I think it depends, like everything else, on the learning objectives, what do you want to get out of it, and who is the audience. And then, and then you can see, is it, is it too long tethered, or is, there a, or is it more easily easily usable. Mm -hmm. And speaking of easily usable, so was there any concern on your part when you were writing it that this situation is too charged and too heightened and that students would look at this, non-cadet non students would look at this and say, it's interesting, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm never gonna be in this situation. Yeah, so uh, that did come out. It came out at round table discussions. It came out throughout. Um, certainly though, although we never could have anticipated it, nor would we wanted it, the charge situations over the past two years that are increasingly all too commonplace have put us in situations whether we're facing a conflict, whether it's um, protests that turn violent, whether we're dining and we're confronted. You know, there mm -hmm. are, Unfortunately, more situations where conflict is happening, which goes to one of our fundamental thoughts, what else can we do to stop, to reduce conflict? How can we address the antecedents of conflicts more wholesomely at a micro level and what we do and then on an organizational level? The other thing though, there was mm, this particular one too charged. Mm, there was a concern that some international students might view this as imperialism. You know, those, those things. Yes, I guess that came out. But, but mm -hmm. you said, well, I think most cases will have some amount of students who will find it objectionable. However, one student in another case I'm working through has, has, has said, well, I need to be aware of these kinds of issues if I'm going to be a better leader. So. And that comes out in your teaching suggestion section of the IM where you talk about diverse audiences and perhaps some challenges with diverse audiences. Uh, when I was reading, uh, in particular, your instructor's manual, like, like you and like the editor-in-chief, Gina, I've been reading a lot of cases lately because we've been getting so many submissions, which is great. Everyone out there listening, please send us your cases because we love to get them. Uh, but of course, I'm looking at it through the same lens that I would a submission, even though this is a published award-winning case. And if you'll allow me to praise you for just a couple of minutes, I thought your theoretical linkages section uh, is a tremendous example that all authors should look at and how to write this section of the IM. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can take a break for the, from the questions and just, just tell everyone in the audience, if you're writing an IM and you're unsure of how to write the theoretical linkages section, read this case and this IM because it will give you an excellent example. Um, your responses to the discussion questions. One thing that I often tell authors uh, in, my, in my comments back when I synthesize the reviews is there's not enough there, that the answers are too brief, um, that you're not getting the points across. In yours, you also have very brief responses to the discussion questions. Um, 
but you communicate a lot. Is that just a stylistic thing? I know I write long, right? So my responses tend to be pages and pages, which I'm sure the reviewers of my cases just love. Uh, but um, yours were very brief. So was this a concerted effort on your part to keep those responses short? Or was this uh, just all you needed to say? Well, I've gone to several of the NACRA sessions on writing cases. And so you have different voices that are helping you along track your work. So, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm influenced by that, where uh, the thought was this, it was expressed to me, as I'm looking at a case, as an adopting instructor, I'm doing a quick read. Uh, I wanna see what the learning objectives are. I wanna see the questions quickly. Uh, I know as an adopting instructor, some amount of the neighborhood. So give me a springboard and then I can take it a little further. I adopting instructor, I'm not a newbie to the material, but I can be brought up to speed quickly and spring off. So that was somewhat the gestalt of when I write cases uh, with the intent that the instructor is somewhat already looking for something broadly in conflict management or has some acumen there and they can pivot from some of the responses easily given their own set of tools so okay um and then in the in the teaching suggestions in the case use there's a lot that was done in teams and groups is this a function of West Point and the way that they run their classrooms? Is this a function of how you run your classrooms? Or is this just this seemed to be what was most suitable for this particular case? Well, we do emphasize here at Seton Hall teamwork, uh, developing teamwork, developing teams, uh, giving students the ability to contribute in a less threatening environment. And teams does that. Uh, so there is that. And then certainly at, at West Point, the whole thing about developing platoons is heavily embedded there, although their class sizes were much smaller, generally 15, 16 students. It'd be odd if you had a class of 18 students. Uh, Seton Hall are at the business school, our class sizes range from 20 to 30, but teamwork is an important competency. So yes, it, it was geared toward that developing that. In addition, because in this particular case, it is somewhat novel, um, the, the team we thought would help the civilian student understand that more by having four brains or five brains on it instead of just one student. Mm -hmm. And can you talk to us at all, give us some examples or some anecdotes if you have them on uh, the use of this case in the classroom with uh, business students as opposed to cadets and and how they've reacted to it and and how effective it's been all right so there are two there are two cases that i've used my first time in the foray of using military was a, israeli special forces and human resource management and so that that was written by someone else and it's a it's a neat little case, a little dated, but it had to do with how you select people for special forces. And the students were intrigued. Same thing happened here. Uh, and then who was a firefighter, who was an EMT, who works on the emergency room could contribute. Uh, there were one or two students I recall vividly in criminal justice, so they were business minors. There is general, uh, intrigue about this so it's they're, they're interested uh, how else can i say it's it's lively um i don't want to say that the video game genre makes this less foreign than you would think because there's all sorts of battle games out there that have made students a little bit closer to battle and for better for worse so it, it's not wasn't that foreign, but uh, I did not detect in any cases um, gender issues. I did not, as a reflect back, anything about international 
students outside the United States. Uh, so I didn't see, I didn't detect any of those surface level barriers that we all look for when we're teaching to make sure um, everyone's moving forward. Okay, I have a couple questions from the chat here um, I'd like to ask you. So the first one is uh, having to do with the short case. Uh, what have to be left out that you can talk to us about uh, with the layer, very layer, various layers of approval that, that you have to go through? And how did you make the decision about what to leave out and what to keep in? Well, we uh, further background about the Afghan war was was getting tedious. Okay. Um, we were concerned about the civilian needing that, where. You know, President Obama went up and spoke to the cadets at one point about the surge in Afghanistan, and he was the commander in chief. So they were well skilled on that. But in terms of the civilian student, we were putting this up in there, and eventually that just had to come out. It was just, it was that that was the biggest slice of information that had to be there. What we were encouraged to put in was the map of the region because geography is, is not a, a, our students don't know the, the world as they should. And there was also a concern about what are the relationships that the two that Matt Pratt had with the, uh, the other, his Afghan counterpart. So we put a little bit more in there. There was a request and we ended up putting in the instructor's manual the military civilian translation. So that was put in the case and then it was taken out at one of the early iterations and put in the IM. So if an instructor needed facility in making that translation, he or she could do that easily without having to take up case pages for it. Okay. Um, and just to follow up, I'm seeing the chat here. So related to that, Besides what you've mentioned already, if you were to make this a full case, a 10 page case or 11 page case, not to suggest that you wouldn't necessarily, what else would you have liked to put in? What, what content that was left out of the short case besides the, the background on the Afghan war do you think would be helpful for, uh, for a full case if this was to be more comprehensive? Um, I think in this case, less is more. You know, okay. you know, I, yeah. I just I didn't think anything more because you the, the notion of urgency, you wanted to maintain that tempo in this in the delivery and longer kind of takes away the urgency that you're mm -hmm. trying to infuse. Yeah, we see cases uh, all the time as, as educators where there's this really compelling decision in the introduction, and then it's three or four pages of background, as you mentioned, that sort of takes the wind out of the sails of that urgency. Um, so maybe there's a lesson for all of us in here in trying to condense it down a little bit. Yeah, more. yeah, the tempo is real important. Um, although I, I can't say there's not a case that comes across my desk that I review for that I don't enjoy reading. Uh, because you learn an awful lot, uh, of course. you know, so, mm -hmm. but the tempo issue, you know, sometimes I, I wonder, although we're not creative writers, whether or not a, a creative lighting, writing lesson might help us all be better writers mm -hmm. to get into that tempo and pacing and characterization yes. that uh, would be useful for us. Um, let's talk about characterization a little bit because we've got these two figures in the case, um, in the conflict. Uh, do you think a richer understanding of their character would lend itself to the class discussion then on their motivations within this conflict? Well, that's a very, very good question because whenever you have an international, you know, not of your own culture, uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be international. Uh, you do have to take time to set the stage mm -hmm. for the student who may not be familiar. Uh, not, yeah, I, I, I still think that let, let the instructor perhaps decide how ready their student body is for the varying and provide materials in the instructor's manual that he or she can pick from yeah. might be the way to augment that. Um, 
I just, I, the main reason for, for asking this is I find that's one area, as you mentioned, the, the creative writing area, but specifically the characterization is I find a lot of us are cautious about making the people in the case into characters as opposed to just names of actors, if you understand the distinction that I'm making. Yeah, I, I, I do know that. And, and it's, um, if you really want to be in the shoes of the protagonist, that protagonist is absorbing everything about the person. Uh, whereas sometimes in the case, we truncate that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the protagonist can see the person, see the facial expression, see the rolling of the eyes when something happened. And sometimes when you put that in a case, it sounds made up. Yeah. Uh, but it really did happen. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the dialogue sounds made up as well. But if you can capture someone's voice, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah, yes, yes. Another question from the chat is, uh, would you say that case writing is moving to new areas such as the military sector that have been relatively unexplored in the public domain? Um, do you see that that's sort of a trend in that direction? Well, I think we're going to see probably more, not in that military or paramilitary, you know, police kinds of cases. Uh, most nations have a body of veterans and some go through officer training at institutions. And whether you're in an ROTC program in the United States or elsewhere, those instructors, even outside the traditional 120 credit academic roster is looking for materials. Uh, so, there, there, is a, there is a use for these. Um, and again, if you want to make a person well-rounded and think about career options outside of Google or a finance company or marketing firm, and our students, I think, are, are becoming more wider in their career options, you know, those going into social entrepreneurship, others going in for nonprofits, I think they need to, they need to be able to see that a case and the concepts they're learning is transferable and easily so. Mm -hmm. um, for the military context, because that's the context of this particular case, um, how widespread is case use in their, their institutes of higher learning? Um, within their, uh, what we consider their traditional business, sociology, and psychology, uh, it is pretty widespread uh, on use of cases. Uh, so I've seen their business cases in their introduction of business, strategic management, and human resources, in change management. I've seen those cases all over the place. Uh, and I'm going to give a shout out to a couple of folks because when my son was doing his master's thesis, uh, in engineering, his press was using more cases in an engineering concept con context and was interviewing some faculty up at West Point in systems engineering mm. and urging, and they want to do more that way as well because it standardizes the learning environment for the student. And then you can pivot off of that, but it gives students a common experience. Mm -hmm. So, but on the traditional management, sociology, psychology side, I'd also say they have a, a, a legal side. There are cases that are used. So, okay. And um, just so you, in, in the context, West Point is middle states accredited. Uh, it has the same assurance of learning objectives, assessment, all those kinds of things that a traditional institution of higher learning has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one uh, final question for now from the chat is, uh, were there any particular major challenges that you faced during the case development? Was there any particular hurdle you had to overcome? Uh, there was my own learning curve. Uh, and then there was, um, you know, the, the tears of approval. Uh, and those, those faculty at West Point, and one third of them have doctorates. Uh, 
one third are rotating military, so they're there for three years. That was Matt Pratt, and one third were are civilian doctors. So that's their their force, their their faculty force. The ones with doctorates, military or not, uh, were more amenable to the academic freedom component of publishing material. The rotating military, since they're still in the chain of command and, and junior in their careers and aspire to greater things in their career, were perhaps a little bit more uh, reserved. However, when Matt Pratt had his exit interview with his department chair as he was completing his third year of, of assignment at West Point, he stated that his single biggest uh, highlight of his three year stint there was writing and publishing this case. Wow. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it is. And so uh, he said he just learned a lot. Um, it opened his eyes. He felt he made a difference. Uh, he worked with other colleagues on developing the chapter of the book. It, you know, he couldn't say more about the experience. Mm -hmm. Now you took this, did you take this case to the conference before it became uh, yes. a CRJ submission? And That's did it. Matt come to the conference as well? Yes, he did. Uh, he came um, and, uh, you know, simple little things. He goes, how should I dress? Uh, uh, you know, do I wear a uniform? Do I not? Mm -hmm. uh, and, but he found that extraordinarily useful. He enjoyed reviewing cases as well, and he had never done that before. So that was illuminating. Mm -hmm. He saw academics in a different light. Uh, he didn't understand what the rise and resubmit process was. Uh, and he also felt even going through that improved his writing in other domains. Great. Uh, yes. So yeah. I have to say the for all those that attended the conference and, and, and it was in Las Vegas that year, whoever was there, you know, he, he was very appreciative of feeling welcomed and learning. And it was a very positive experience and out of his, out of his comfort zone. So when I go into a, a meeting with 400 people and everyone's wearing fatigues and I'm wearing something civilian, he felt just the reverse wearing his uniform and everyone was a civilian and uh, mm -hmm. it was it was good good um and for for anyone who happens to be unfamiliar with the conference that karen's talking about and how wonderful it is uh, we're talking about the NACRA conference um it takes place in october every year and michael or gina will post the details in the chat about the deadline and where to go to submit your cases um because if you haven't been to this conference before it is very different from any other conference um out there and uh, it's a, as a case writer, it is an invaluable experience. Yeah, it, and he, he saw uh, again that that collegial spirit of development, um, which was a philosophy that uh, he took further in his career in the ar in the army, not for writing cases, but more on the development of, of, of people, where you stress it, but he saw it in action in a different way. Uh, which was good for him. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, another question, uh, which is, having done this now, do you prefer to write regular submission cases or long cases, or do you prefer to write short cases? Yeah, I think, I think I'm leaning more and more toward the short cases. Uh, it's not that the instructor manual gets shorted at all, but it's the, uh, the clip of time and the the span of students, I hate to say this because I don't want to succumb to oh, students don't read, but uh, they don't. Uh, mm -hmm. So if, if you can pack something in and then let the instructor perhaps jump off at, at different points where they can expand it, I think that that works. Um, for higher level students, you know, the, the MBA student or the the capstone course in IT, that sort of thing, you're going to probably want to have the deeper, messier case. But if you're scaffolding something for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors, there might be something to be said for shorter in the beginning and then getting longer 
as the experience of the student is commensurate with that increased capability. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree. It, it has to do with what you're trying to cover. And as you said earlier on, you know, what are the learning objectives? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, but with a very focused case, it also serves as an opportunity to improve your writing um, because it forces you to really think about what needs to be in the case and what doesn't. Um, and as I said before, I write long. So any, uh, any opportunity I have to be forced into a, a tighter space uh, writing wise is going to help me in the long run. Um, so you won the, the Tate Award for this case um, and you've published a lot of cases, you've written a lot of cases. Did you know something was special about this case when you submitted it? Uh, did you think this is, this is one that could really uh, catch people's attention? When Matt started talking about his experiences, I got sweaty palms because I was scared for him. Uh, it, it unnerved me. Uh, and I said, oh my goodness. So I, I, I was, I'm no different than other people who might be in that kind of a situation. So I thought that that, that there was, it had a potential to tell a neat story. Um, however, we did feel that it was an unusual setting. So whether or not it was gonna have legs that way, but I did believe that the story was useful and a good platform for a chapter on conflict management, but we didn't have a sense whether um, others, whether setting would cause it to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, whereas another case that I wrote that had to do with a job, Maria Gonzalez, um, that, that I felt when I was doing that wasn't going to have the same stumbling block. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, in the instructor's manual, there's a couple of sections that I don't often see. There's there's the case development section that you wrote, and there's the author's reflection section. So I want to ask you about those. These are not sections I've really written uh, as part of an IM before, and I don't often see them, as I said. So is this something you typically put into your IMs, and or is this you yeah. felt compelled to add them for this case? Yeah, the reflections we felt wasn't important that, that was one of the reviewers I don't know who had had suggested perhaps doing something on that because we had put it in there the teaching methods and they said well put it in reflection so you're not gobbling up an instructor's time in the methods but um we also had wanted to um begin to have people think about their work you know self-reflection about we in academia is so important uh, you know most of us after class is over we think about well, did that go right what could i have done differently we we do that and uh, we wanted to put that in as well to perhaps begin to be standardized reflection what did we learn because others might learn from that as well in their own journeys mm -hmm. um, and very frequently, infrequently, do we share what we learned individually when we leave a classroom. If there's a teaching workshop or someone asks, you might raise your hand and here's what I do. But that's somewhat happenstance. So we wanted to be able to give people time to reflect and then maybe have them think about how, how they teach and what they do. Mm -hmm. Um, on the reflection section, we do have a, a question from the chat. Can you just talk us through what's in that section uh, for right. you, as well as for the uh, case development section for right. the audience who may not have read it? So the, the, on, on the, the, I'll do the case development first. It was just going through trials, what we learned. Um, but on the reflection, it was, again, this tangling up whether or not Matt was going to face insubordination charges. And the thought about taking a boss's directive, in this case, it was an officer, but we all get directives from bosses that are somewhat unclear. Um, that's because sometimes our superiors don't know exactly what they wanted, and but we have to operate in the spirit of what that was. So we, we grappled with that and we really wanted to, to talk about 
when you're given something to do, uh, chain a command or not, how do you implement the spirit of that? So we wanted to infuse that reflection because it was a, an important piece of what was what Matt felt he would be at risk. And I have to tell some of his other colleagues who are rotating um, and even the students at West Point were wondering whether or not he would have been, he could have come up on charges for taking off his helmet and doing things that were not appropriate for the standard army regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we wanted to share that. Yes, no, that's great, that's great. Um, now, I wanna ask you and put you on the spot a little bit here about a section that's not in the IM because it wasn't something that was on anyone's radar at the time. Uh, nowadays, we are asking um, people, authors, to include te uh, teaching suggestions for online classrooms, given what's happened over the past year and the fact that online is probably not going away. So could you give us some ideas that come to mind for what you might suggest for this case if it was being taught in an online environment that might be different from how it's being taught because it's so heightened and interactive and you don't want to necessarily lose that um, in, the, uh, in the Zoom class format. Oh dear. Well, if there is some way to make a, a video or a, a verbal script of this, um, that might help enliven it. So even if you couldn't do a slick video, even if you could have students play the part of certain elements, that might help the exchange happen. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it can still be done in teams with the discussion groups. Um, but uh, increasingly, I, I, there's going to be something lost in the urgency. I don't know how else to say it. It's just yeah. going to be lost. So um, and on that note, is it possible there are just some cases that if they're going to be, if, if a course is going to be delivered online or in a hybrid format, that maybe it's not the right case for that format. Yeah, you know, I that's that I do think that's worthwhile. You know, is this the best method? Is this the best instrument for what I have to teach, knowing the methodology online or whatever? I think it's a legitimate question. Even as I think about things that I do in person and having to change that. This may not be for your institutions, but in my own case, I feel like I'm robbing students of something when I can't be in the classroom mm -hmm. explaining a concept. Yeah, and because this was new to so many of us this year, it's these little learnings of, of okay, it's not just changing the format of how I deliver the case, it's changing which cases that I pick. Yes, and you know, in some cases, I think it's legitimate to say this should not be taught all online. Fair enough. Fair you know, enough. Yeah. Um, there's another question from the chat, which is how long did it take uh, from the time that you got this idea from the time Matt told you the story until you had a finished sure. case ready for submission? Okay, so easy enough. So, you know, fortunately I was on sabbatical. So it was the spring of 2016 when this particular happened. So the timeline will have to be adjusted for the non-sabbatical life that a person might be in. But I remember uh, Colonel Smith came to me in February about the chapter in the book, but I team up with Matt to do that. So you're talking about February, 2016. We started talking about the case. I said, well, there's an ACRA submission deadline in June. Let's put a deadline in there because the deadline for the chapter in the book was further out. And we thought that we could perhaps uh, prime the pump, so to speak, in our work with that deadline. So uh, we, we aimed to get the case done in June for that submission, and it was a full-blown, it wasn't a startup. And, and so we met that deadline while we were working in parallel with the chapter in the case, and some of the material on, on the theoretical linkages was able to be um, reused, not reused, but adapted or informed on the chapter in the book. So then we, we, uh, we had certain revisions from the summer review process, process from NACRA. 
We went to the NACA conference in October, and then we had revise and resubmit that in and around January of 2017 with NDAC. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Um, did the approvals process lengthen that uh, more so than it would have otherwise? You said adjust the clock for the sabbatical. Did you have to adjust the clock for the more rigorous? Uh, I'll tell you what really helped. Um, getting it accepted for the conference. Um, nobody likes a loser. And when they saw this was accepted for a conference, all of a sudden, people, oh, this could be used. Uh, uh, you know, civilians read this. It's, this is, you know, good. Uh, so that, that cloud things immensely. And then when it won an award at a conference, then it made the superintendent's newsletter for the month of November. Uh, but the success helped shut down folks because then you had academics at the academy proud and happy moving forward. And they helped quell the cautious bees out. Mm -hmm. um, great. So we only have a few minutes left. If there are any remaining questions amongst our audience, please put them in the chat and I will get to them. Um, I would like to ask you just not to, not to keep beating the same drum, but about the approvals, uh, because this is something that a lot of authors do have concerns about. Uh, you know, it's daunting that I'm going to put in this work and then the company may not uh, sign off on it, or they may request changes that significantly gut the case and, and don't allow me to do uh, what I want to do. Now, you incorporated disguise um, as well. Do you have any advice to authors in terms of how to approach this? Having learned this in a, in a new context, uh, do you have advice for, for authors dealing with corporate approvals? Well, I think, I think it's somewhat helpful to go to the overarching concept that we all have to, make, to, to improve the life of the students we teach, to make them better informed. Uh, we all have to put our oar in the water on that. And that means some organizations have to give us access to learning materials. That's what I, I try to, you know, the overarching, this is not about me getting a hit on my resume. It's about the next generation of, of leaders, wherever they may be, whatever organization. Who's supposed to be doing that work? Well, we are. Well, we can't do it alone. And we're going to take, if organizations want to have better employees, wherever they are in their organization, someone has to do the heavy work in developing that. So that's their stake. And um, you know, sometimes you might find it useful to show other things that have been published and what can be done. Because mm -hmm. I, did, I did fail in one a nonprofit organization trying to convince them to publish a case. And it had to do with a, uh, a resort in the Poconos that was going downhill fast because lifestyles changed and nobody was going from Philadelphia to the Poconos to do the summer anymore. Their children were not going there. It just was a dying thing and home prices were devaluing. And I, and I said, I'd like to do a case on change management there and what you need to do and the environmental forces, whatever, whatever. Met with the board, they were having none of it, none of it. And I tried to explain and it just dead ended. Um, so you don't always win that battle. I, I identify fully because I had a very similar situation with a very similar uh, type of organization. It was a summer camp that yeah. uh, that had uh, essentially died out and had come back from the dead. Um, and the chair of the board was fully enthusiastic about telling the story, but um, I just it was very difficult to get the rest of the board to sign off on it. I know. So, I said I can disguise it. I can put it upstate New York, so it's not in the Poconos. On and on and on. No, it was, um, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. So Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time today, Karen. I appreciate it. Thank you also for all the time you've been putting into the journal um, because, uh, because that's it. The, the role of the reviewers and the editor and the associate editors is, is there would be no journal without them. And so thank you to our audience who review cases uh, for the journal. And thank you to Karen. Thank you for our audience, uh, to our audience for attending today and for your questions. 
Our next uh, webinar is taking place on June 21st. It is specifically geared towards authors in India um, and how authors, because we get a lot of submissions at the journal from um, authors based in India. And so we'd like to, to devote some time to helping those authors prepare their cases for submission to CRJ. Um, Deba Pratim Perkayasta, I apologize for the pronunciation, will be moderating um, a discussion by Gina and uh, Gina Grandi, the editor of CRJ, and myself on that date. So thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you, Karen, for sharing your, your experience and your wisdom. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.